Hi everyone and welcome back to Advanced Higher Biology. Today we're going to finish up the second key area, uh, proteins of Unit 1, and this is Part C called Protein Structure, Ligand Binding and Conformational Change. So we've previously looked at how proteins are synthesised and this sub-key area here is going to look at what else is going to happen to these proteins, how they can change, how they react to the binding of other molecules and how that affects their function. So to start off, when we talk about proteins being synthesised, you may remember from higher that proteins are polymers of amino acid monomers. So the amino acids are all linked together with a peptide bond into a polypeptide chain. That's what makes a protein. And therefore, the amino acid sequence determines the structure of the protein that is synthesised. Now, we're going to go into a bit more detail about amino acids in advanced higher, which goes worryingly into the chemistry side, but not enough for you to be worried about. So first of all, if we're looking at this diagram here, we can see that amino acids are linked together by peptide bonds to form polypeptides, like we've said before and like we talked about in higher. However, now you need to be able to recognise that peptide bond, which is shown in the blue square just in front of you here. So those peptide bonds are what's linking all those amino acids, like I said, into this polypeptide chain. Now, the peptide bond is a strong covalent bond and it's formed of a, it's formed between sorry, the carbon atom of one amino acid and the nitrogen atom of the other that you can see on the left and on the right here, joining into this peptide bond. In terms of this structure then, amino acids are then made up of two functional groups. You have the amine group in the sort of orangey pink box here, the NH2, and the carboxylic acid group in the blue, a Q group. Now, you'll be able to recognise amino acids by seeing these two structures, these two groups, but there's also going to be an R group that you can see in the middle top here. And the R group is what you can use in order to identify the group of amino acids that that amino acid belongs to. So, uh, these R groups are going to vary both in size, shape, charge, hydrogen bonding, capacity, and those chemical reactivities. And like I said, we're going to be using these in order to actually classify the amino acid. So there are four uh, main categories of amino acids in terms of the R groups. We have basic R groups, which have an amine group. So if you see an NH2 on top of the one that is already there, then that is going to be a basic uh, R group. You have acidic that has another carboxylic acid group, the Q group as well. And then we have polar, which can have a bit of a range, the carbonyl group, hydroxyl, or an amine and then hydrophobic that has a hydrocarbon group, that's CH3, that makes it quite distinctive. So you don't need to memorise to be able to name all the different amino acids individually, but you do need to be able to look at the R group that is added to the amino acid and use that to categorise them. So just to try and give you a little bit more detail here and show you what some of them look like, remember you're going to have the first amine group and um, Q group that form the amino acid and it's the additional R group that you're using in order to, to classify them. So if you see an NH2 that doesn't mean straight away it's basic because all amino acids have that NH2. You're looking at the R group on top. So for example here you can see the amino acid side chain here is NH2. That means it is a basic R group. In this one here again if you're spotting an additional carboxylic acid or Q group here then you can see that is acidic. And as I said, the polar groups, there are a few here, but if you're seeing an OH, for example, a hydroxyl in this description here, that would be polar. Polar are also hydrophilic, which is going to be really important in the next key area, so we'll come back to that. And your hydrophobic, which are non-polar, they have that hydrocarbon group, that CH3 that's added on. So there's quite a good example in past papers of trying to quantify these, have a look at which ones you can categorise, go and take a little look at them. Now, in terms of the amino acids and are linked up to form these proteins, we're also going to look at different types of protein structure. And again, you're going to have to be able to classify what form of structure is present in this protein. And that different level of uh, structure is also going to fit the function of a protein as well. So they're quite easily named. We've got primary structures, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. And you can see they become slightly more complex as each goes on. So for your primary structure, this is essentially just that polypeptide chain that we've talked about before. So the primary structure of a protein is just that sequence in which those amino acids are synthesized into a polypeptide with those peptide bonds between each amino acid. So that big chain like that. 
And secondary structure is something that we also touched on a little bit in higher biology as well, because we talked about the primary structure of a protein, all your amino acids in a polypeptide chain, and we mentioned how you can use hydrogen bonding in order to change the shape and therefore change the function of that protein. So again, just to be a bit more precise, we're now talking about this would be secondary structure. So hydrogen bonds are able to work along the backbone of a protein and they can pull them into different shapes. And these are usually formed in alpha helices that you can see in the diagram here. So these spiral, these helix, helix structures are alpha helices. Or you can have beta pleated sheets as well. And again, you can see this at the bottom where they're just sort of folded into sheets. There's almost a bit of a, a pleat, a wave running through them. Or you can have turns also as well. So just to remember that secondary structure, the next form of the structure, uses hydrogen bonding. Tertiary structure is where it gets a little bit more mad. So these polypeptides fold into this next stage, the tertiary structure, and that's stabilized by interactions between the R groups of those amino acids. And there's a big bunch of them that you need to be aware of here. So you could have hydrophobic interactions, ionic bonds, London dispersion forces, more hydrogen bonds can jump in here as well. And you can also have these disulfide bridges that you can see in the diagram on the right hand side that's linking again between those two R groups of the amino acids, pulling them into that tertiary structure that you can see is a lot more like, sort of like a ball of string being wound up. And the final form you can have is that quaternary structure. And that exists in proteins with either two or more connected polypeptide subunits. And this is used to describe the spatial arrangement of these subunits which is what we're going to come into next. So uh, the next part we're going to look at is you've seen before in National 5 and higher is the effect of things like temperature and pH and proteins. What we're going to be talking about is specifically the effect of temperature and pH on R group interactions. So essentially, it makes sense the way that you know that increase in temperature is going to disrupt the interactions that hold the protein in shape. And if there's an increase in temperature, the protein is going to unfold and eventually it's going to become denatured. It's like, for example, when people use uh, straighteners or heat products to straighten hair. The idea there is that you're disrupting the interactions within the proteins in keratin, and that's going to make it unfold. If you do that too much, though, it's going to damage those proteins, which could be an issue as well. So increase in temperature will disrupt interactions, and the charges of acidic and basic R groups that we've seen in the amino acids are affected by pH. So as pH increases or decreases from the optimum pH that those proteins are in, the normal uh, ionic interactions between those are lost. And again, if you lose those interactions or if there's a negative impact on those interactions, then these are going to change the conformation, the shape of that protein, and again, it will become denatured. So as that pH moves away from optimum, well, it's up or down, if it's away from optimum, it's going to lose those charges, it's going to lose those interactions, the conformation is going to change, and the protein becomes denatured. Next, we're going to move on to ligands, and this is going to go on to a few parts of molecules, how they bind to proteins, and the impact they have. So, uh, apologies for not a lot of very nice diagrams for the next few slides, but the information is the, the most important part here. So, a ligand is a substance that binds to a protein. That's just a standard statement you need to be aware of, also a question that can appear as well. Now, in terms of R groups that this part of the sub area is focused on, R groups not involved in protein folding can allow binding to ligands. And these binding sites will have a complementary shape and a chemistry to the ligand. So like a lot of the things we've talked about proteins, they're going to be matching, it's like that jigsaw piece fitting together. Now, as a ligand binds to a protein binding site, Again, this conformation of the protein is going to change. If there's a change to the conformation, the shape, then there's going to be a change in the functional uh, change in the protein. So the function is going to be different in the protein. And a lot of this sub area and the next key area really focuses on how one impact on a protein changes the conformation or the shape, which is then going to change the function. Now, you may have came across allosteric proteins before when you talked about enzymes in higher biology. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail about these and what they do. So allosteric interactions occur between these spatially distinct sites of the protein. So many allosteric proteins are made up of multiple subunits. And if you remember, when we talk about these different subunits in a protein, we're talking about that quaternary structure. Now, the binding of a substrate molecule to one active site of an allosteric enzyme is going to increase the affinity of other active sites 
for binding of subsequent substrate molecules. And we're going to be using hemoglobin if one substrate molecule binds to one active site, that's going to have a knock-on impact of the affinity of other active sites. And if you have forgot what affinity means, the affinity is essentially the attraction of that substrate to bind to a molecule. If there's a high affinity, they're, they're sort of pulled towards each other, they want to bind. And if there's a decrease or a low affinity, then they're going to move apart. So initially in higher, we talked about the high affinity of a substrate for an active site means that the substrate is going to bind. And then after an enzyme reaction, the product is going to have a low affinity for the active site, so it moves away from it. So this is going to be really important because therefore the activity of these allosteric enzymes can vary in little changes in the substrate concentration. Now, allosteric proteins with multiple subunits are going to show what we call cooperativity in their binding. So that's going back to what we said beforehand. If there's cooperativity, it means that a change in the binding site or the binding, sorry, of one subunit is going to have a knock-on impact to the affinity of those remaining subunits. So going back to these allosteric enzymes that I mentioned, this is again just a little diagram to jog your memory. You can have an active site at the top of an enzyme and you can have that allosteric site that's around the back and that's where your uh, non-competitive inhibitors would bind to, if you remember from, from higher. Now, there's, uh, these allosteric sites are going to be used by something called a modulator. And a modulator protein is going to regulate the activity of the enzyme when they bind to that allosteric site. So if a modulator comes across and binds to an allosteric site, it's going to have some form of impact on the activity of the enzyme. And they do this through positive modulators and negative modulators. So this is fairly simple, but just try and get it into your head. That if a positive modulator is to bind to the allosteric site of an enzyme, it's going to increase the enzyme's affinity for the substrate. So I've just tried to show this in a plus on the active site here. So it makes sense, positive, increase, that makes sense. For negative modulators, they're obviously going to do the opposite. If a negative modulator binds to the allosteric site of an enzyme, what is then going to happen is it's going to have a negative impact on the affinity, so it's decreasing the enzyme's affinity for the substrate, so no substrate is going to bind. It's going to become harder for that substrate to bind, there's no affinity. So like I said, we're going to have a look at hemoglobin because this is also a question that comes up, but it's good to have a real life case study to go through quite heavy theory and see how this works. So if you're not aware, uh, hemoglobin is very, very important in your blood for the binding of oxygen. So the binding and release of oxygen, the hemoglobin, shows that cooperativity that we talked about. So again, the cooperativity in a protein is when the binding of, in this example, oxygen at one subunit is going to change the affinity in the remaining subunits for oxygen. Now, essentially what happens here, there's a graph called an oxygen dissociation curve that explains this quite nicely. Essentially, at low oxygen concentrations, those subunits on hemoglobin are quite tightly bound together and it's very, very difficult for any of that oxygen to be absorbed. And we want that oxygen to be absorbed by the hemoglobin. However, once one oxygen molecule binds, the structure of hemoglobin relaxes, and then it means it's going to be easier for the other oxygen molecules to bind to the other subunits on the hemoglobin. So therefore, more oxygen is going to get absorbed, the more there is. And again, that's that cooperativity at work, and that's the one subunit having an impact on the affinity to the other subunits. You also need to know the effect of environmental conditions as well. So a decrease in pH or an increase in temperature is going to lower the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. That means that, that binding of oxygen is going to be reduced. So just try and remember that it's, it's an opposite here. Decrease in pH, increase in temperature. Now, this can be a very good thing though because the reduced pH and increased temperature in actively respiring tissue so in this tissue that's, that's got the oxygen going around your body, that's going to reduce the binding of oxygen. And therefore, if it reduces the binding of the oxygen, then the hemoglobin is going to increase oxygen delivery to those tissues. It's going to release that oxygen. Okay? You want it to bind in the original point, but you want it also to be released at another stage. So again, showing cooperativity here. And the final part we're going to look at here is phosphate food. So again, you may remember a bit of phosphorylation even from uh, National 5 and in higher we talked about it as well. 
So in terms of another change to proteins that has an impact, uh, a common form of post-translational modification is going to be the addition or removal of phosphate. So in a very broad sense, you may have an, an inactive protein and you add a phosphate, so go through phosphorylation, and you then have an active protein. But this can also be reversed as well. So if you remove that phosphate, then that protein becomes inactive. Okay, and it works both ways. Now, uh, there's two proteins I want you to know about as well that are going to help with this process. So a kinase is going to catalyze that transfer of a phosphate from one protein to other proteins. So the terminal phosphate of ATP, if you remember when that's broken off to become ADP, that's going to be transferred to the specific R groups in a protein. So a kinase is going to be used to add phosphate for phosphorylation. And then finally, phosphatases will do the reverse. They will remove that phosphate. So again, remember, kinases for phosphorylation and then phosphatases for dephosphorylation. And both of those are going to have changes again in the conformation, the shape of the protein, therefore also changes in the function of that protein as well. And in terms of this, like I mentioned, this is what it really comes on about throughout this whole sub -care. Any change, that conformational change, it's going to affect the activity, the function of a protein, which is going to be very, very important as we go on into the next key area. So that's been quite a, a lengthy video and it's quite heavy. Try and go through it and make sure you're happy with the structures, uh, different structures of protein, the different amino acid R groups and the impacts we can have through modulators, allosteric sites and cooperativity in the proteins. And that's all for this key area. We'll be moving on to key area three next time and look forward to seeing you then. Okay, bye for now.